Welcome back. Last week y'all had a break and, and didn't have to watch any of my recorded lectures, but hopefully um, you guys are enjoying them a little bit, or at least it's a little bit helpful to you. Um, but we are talking about a uh, big subject in American history, the American Revolution. And not only is it important because it was influential in how our country was developed, it also is going to be the subject of your midterm paper. So hopefully you're going to uh, find this a little bit interesting in addition to um, helpful to you. Okay, so, um, so basically um, to kind of get the, this, I mean, there's could be entire college classes on the road to the revolution. So this is a really big subject that I'm trying to put together in a very short amount of time, but I will try to make sure I get as much information to you as I can on this. But essentially, um, really the beginning of the tension in the colonies, because before this, the colonists were extremely happy British citizens. But the very end of that happiness, I, I say that, but I also want to make sure you guys understand that actually most colonists were actually very happy British citizens and arguably all the way to the Declaration of Independence, even through that. Um, historians estimate that between like 55 to 60 percent of the people were on board with separating from England at that time. So that means that there was a big group of people that actually wanted to remain loyal to the crown. Okay, but the really beginning of the issues began with something known as the French and Indian War. And the French and Indian War was actually part of a greater war called the Seven Years War that occurred in Europe at that time. And they called the French and Indian War for the area that began really contested over the colonies, the colonial um, settlements that the French and the British argued over. It's called the French and Indian War, but the French and Indians are who the British actually fight. And uh, the British colonists that were there, they uh, fought for the British. And um, their expectations after the French and Indian War were to get um, land because that's what they were promised. And so a lot of these colonists are very upset because they're not given the land that they were really promised during this time. Okay, so that really begins what's known here, um, Parliamentary Sovereignty Proclamation Line. Um, this is where you start to hear taxation without representation, okay, which really occurs first with the Sugar Act, Stamp Acts of Major Acts, and then, of course, they move to um, more militant acts with the colonists, the Boston Tea Party and Tarlow Blacks, and the first battle, Lexington and Concord, which is known as the shots heard around the world. And finally, we lead up to the Declaration of Independence in 1776. Okay, so we're going to kind of look at this as um, what happened, what kind of action did the British take, and what kind of reaction did the colonists have to it. Okay, so the very first thing that happens is something known as the Proclamation Line. And the proclamation line was created by the British as a way to separate the colonists from the Native American groups that were very upset at the encroachment on their lands. Um, there was a, a battle called um, Pontiac's Rebellion that happened in 1763 where the British really realized that they needed to create this proclamation line um, in order to protect the colonists and also not to spend the money to have to protect the colonists from Native American raids. And so the colonists reacted to this by, as you can tell, um, that by strictly just moving to the settlement anyway. Okay, so they moved westward anyway. They become very upset because a lot of them, including people like George Washington, were promised that land and they felt that they were really kept from settling there. Um, and they felt it was their right to move forward and settle. Okay, so let's take a look at a map and kind of see what this uh, is. So if you take a look at this map carefully here, this is um, the land right here that they gained, about right here, the land that they gained from the French. Okay, so any of this land here, this was disputed land between, land between the French and the British. So this is land that essentially they gain all the way to the Mississippi River. And so uh, the colonists' expectation is that they are able to settle west, particularly this very fertile land known as the Ohio River Valley right over here. And um, they expect to be pushing forward that way. But when there's a Pontiac's Rebellion here in Michigan, 
if you know familiar with Pontiac, Michigan, that's where they get the name from. But essentially, uh, after that happens, they draw a line known as the proclamation line. That's this red dotted line here. And essentially what happens there is that they think that they should be able to settle in this land, but that is not the case, okay? Um, and this starts tensions between the British and the colonists. Okay, so the next thing that happens is that the British begin something known as the Writs of Assistance. Now, the, the British instituted something known as the Navigation Acts in 1680, but the colonists um, just ignored it. They kind of traded with whomever anyway. And so the British, because they were trying to recoup so much money that they had lost during the French and Indian War, um, it issued something called the Writs of Assistance, which tried to stop them from illegally smuggling goods uh, back and forth and trading. When I say illegal, illegally smuggling, it's not like what we consider today as illegally smuggling. They were supposed to, according to the Navigation Acts, all trade is supposed to go through British ports, but they avoid that um, because they don't want to pay the tariffs. And so this is what is considered smuggling during that time period. So the, um, the writs of assistance were like legal papers that custom officials would have to look through in order to be able to you know, transport goods. Um, they say that this kind of violates their rights as English citizens because the, um, the custom officials were able to uh, look at all these official papers and they were able to search um, boats without any kind of legal, certain, you know, kind of like what our Fourth Amendment is today, illegal search and seizure. So to kind of give it a visual, um, so the custom officials would essentially be able to get a written order and go into any place that they wanted to, okay, and a kind of search and seizure. By the way, I want you to be thinking about these things because all of these things that happened to the colonists before the American Revolution, it's going to come to be when we come, they write the, the Bill of Rights. That's later going to equate to some way that they felt that they were violated um, during this, this issue with, uh, with the British during the Revolutionary War. Um, the first real act that's passed is something called the Sugar Act of 1764. And it was basically an indirect tax, meaning not everybody was affected, just people that were trading sugar and taking sugar. Uh, but any, anyway, if they did not pay that direct tax, um, the smugglers were tried in something called Vice Admiralty Court. Um, and basically, any time that you went into that court, um, it was almost guaranteed guilty verdict. Okay, the judges, like I mentioned right here, were paid on guilty verdicts. Um, and interestingly enough, one act uh, went that the uh, colonists get involved in during this time is uh, smuggling and bribing custom officials. And interestingly enough, these custom officials would take bribes. Most of the custom officials were bribed because they were making more money by being bribed by colonial merchants than they were as being a customs officer. So that kind of doesn't help them, the British that is. And here's like a bad joke for you. They got rid of the molasses act and made sugar act to, you know, sweeten the deal. And I didn't make this meme. I wouldn't have spelled sugar wrong. But anyway, moving on here. Um, the next big act, now this is a really important act. It was the, the Stamp Act. And this is what we called a direct tax because it essentially affected all of the colonists. If you got any written paper during this time period, it would be taxed. We're talking about a marriage license, a birth license, not just, you know, anything, any kind of legal paper would be require a special stamp on the paper. Um, and that is where they get the Stamp Act from. So this really uh, inadvertently organizes the colonies to get together and really be upset about the Stamp Act. And so they organized boycotts, the Stamp Act Congress, and you see the very beginnings of the Sons of Liberty that comes out of this. And they also, you know, write this formal, you know, grievances and rights they issue to Parliament. And this is also where we start to hear the chant, taxation without representation. So arguably, this is going to be probably the most important out of all the taxes that happened during this time. 
So, I mean, mobs were forming because of the Stamp Act. They were so incredibly upset about this tax that they felt they had no say-so in whatsoever. And like I mentioned before, you know, here's like an image of the, they're having, you know, all kinds of protests involved in this. Um, and the Sons and Daughters of Liberty are formed in, in reaction to this. They become what's known as the Leaders in Resistance. So the Sons of Liberty were, they really start in Boston and they were a group of people and usually they were like kind of the upper class, not like totally elite, but educated that organized this less educated to have like mob rule and take over. Daughters of Liberty were a way for women to get involved and they, you know, put up pamphlets, they made um, homespun goods and for women actually this gave them quite a bit of autonomy. Um, so their boycotts were actually effective uh, in their Stamp Act Congress that they formed and they repealed, Britain repealed, which means to get rid of the Stamp Act. So that was actually an efficient thing for them to do. So in reaction to this, the British passed what's known as the Township Acts. And this is like a series of taxes on all kinds of different goods. And they also begin to station colonial troops in order to stop any kind of protest. Okay, and this is a, a this is an indirect tax because it would be a tax that was you know on only on those goods that you purchased. Okay, they start protesting taxation without representation again with this in reaction to these, and uh, there's some more boycotting and things of that nature. This is a really famous image um, known as like the tar and feathering, um, and uh, so this is a. And, and if you guys haven't already seen the tar and feathering scene from John Adams, I'm going to put that as a link for you to watch. It's, it's crazy. It's a crazy scene to watch. But they would do this to custom officials. In the scene that you're going to, that you'll watch, if you, if you want to pause and watch it now, or you can watch it here in a little bit. But essentially in the John Adams scene, uh, it's John Adams. This is from the HBO series that's extremely good called John Adams. And essentially what happens is that John, Sam Adams, who's uncomfortably John Adams' cousin, and I say that because Sam Adams was like a huge leader in the Sons of Liberty, and John Adams was definitely a patriot, but he did not believe in mob rule. And you can see that from the clip that we watch. But this is a, um, this is a very famous political cartoon done by a British columnist trying to show how how savage the colonists had become and so they're tarring and feathering uh, this custom official because of the tea tax and so it shows like the super brutal nature of them you can see the looks on their faces the the word stamp act is is on the tree and noose and so they were pretty pretty brutal um the sons of liberty okay but that wasn't the only way that they protested. They also began to form organize, organized complaints. And before this happened, and this is important because before this, the colonies almost functioned like their own separate little countries. Okay, so but when they start realizing that they all don't like the treatment of the British and the treatment that they're receiving as what they feel like they shouldn't be receiving more as British citizens, they form and organize. And one thing was the committees of correspondence. So this is like 18th century uh, to Twitter and you know Instagram and instant messages that you would you would basically write back and forth to different colonies kind of complaining about the treatment that they had so those were important okay so the next big event was the Boston Massacre and again the Townshed Acts that I mentioned before the British troops were stationed and they were taunting like these angry Boston um, and well okay I, I say taunting but really there's quite a bit of um, contest, contestation about exactly what happened. But um, it was actually an angry mob that was, that was antagonizing a group of soldiers or a few group of soldiers upset about um, the quartering that was occurring there in the colonies at the time, also upset for a variety of different reasons. But essentially, they know that they think it started with the colonists throwing sticks and maybe um, snowballs, some people say. They don't really know. Uh, but sticks, stones, things like that at the troops. And it turned into like this mob against the troops. The troops turned around. More of them were called. In the melee of it, shots were fired. Five colonists end up dying. Okay. 
And uh, they use this as like, particularly at Sons of Liberty, use this as a call to action to get people going because of this. All right, so the colonial agitators, they label the conflict like um, massacre. They, they, and I'm going to show you an image in just a minute, but they dramatize the event and really uses this kind of like propaganda. Okay, but here's like a visual. They throw ice. This is a version thinking that they throw ice. Um, and then a mob draws over here to see what's going on. Okay, um, the British respond to come help and then uh, attack the mob. There's a big, big melee going on. And so this is a very famous image um, down here that happened of Paul Revere drew. And interestingly enough, Paul Revere's like the very first propagandist. He was a major player in the Sons of Liberty. And I'm going to show you this image and let's take a look at the uh, propaganda. It's also important to note, Paul Revere was not actually at, um, he wasn't actually there. He recreated the scene from stuff that he heard from people. So it's important to note that too when you take a look at the image. So this is his image, okay? So as you can tell, who really looks like the aggressor here? It's, you know, the poor colonists are being attacked by the British. The captain for sure looks like he's, um, looks like he's calling and telling them to shoot. Turns out that they don't really fully believe that that's what happened. So the colonists injured the British soldiers, snowballs, oyster shells, um, and you can take a look at the people here. Um, and they definitely, with only four dead, this was hardly what they really considered a massacre. They called this that, um, but that really wasn't what it was. Um, interestingly enough, too, this man, the first one that was killed, uh, was actually a man named Crispus Attucks, uh, and he was not white. Okay, he was actually a mixed African American and Native American, but they painted him as white, and they did that because they felt if they put a black man there that they would not garner the same sympathy that they would have. Okay, so the next thing that happens is the Tea Act. So interesting on this one too is the Tea Act wasn't actually this horrible thing. Okay, the East India Tea Company, um, they uh, were given exclusive rights to sell tea in the colonies and the colony colonists didn't want to have to purchase from the East India Tea Company. They wanted to be able to purchase wherever they wanted to and they didn't want to pay this tax because they had great smuggled tea that was coming into the country. And so the colonists, interestingly enough too, the East India Tea Company, even with the tariff, was cheaper than the smuggled tea. But the idea was that they were being forced to drink tea that they didn't want to and pay the tax that they were not represented in. So this is why they react that they do. And of course, very famously, they uh, the Boston Tea Party, where they dressed up as Mohawk Indians and dumped 18,000 pounds of tea into the harbor of the um, Boston Harbor. Um, and here's like a reenactment of it. They dressed up like Mohawk Indians. Interesting of this, out of all of the events, you can see all these little things are happening with the Boston Massacre and the way that they're protesting. This is really what makes the British angry. The, ang the British are like, okay, we're okay with the violence, but now you're dumping tea, and that's, you know, in today's time, millions of dollars of, uh, of, of money for the British government. And in reaction to this, in reaction to this event, they punish Boston, because Boston, by the way, is like the very, very bad child to them. Okay, so the uh, what's passed is the Intolerable Acts. These were actually called the Coercive Acts, but the colonists call this, these the Intolerable Acts. King George and Parliament tighten control. There's a, there's like four different things that they do. They close Boston Harbor. They force them to pay for the tea. They took away their colonial legislature and instituted like um, uh, uh, they instituted colonial people that they assigned. Okay, appointed members. And, and so they really kind of tighten the reins on Boston. And so the reaction to this, the colonial reaction to this one is that they create the very first Continental Congress. This is later going to be the Congress that launches the revolution itself. And so again, uh, this kind of inadvertently calls them all together. This is, um, this is where Patrick Henry makes his famous speech in Virginia, give me liberty or give me death. And uh, they all kind of join together and say that they have to help, um, they have to help Boston, okay? 
All right, so we still haven't declared independence yet, though, okay? So what basically ends up happening is Lexington and Concord, um, you know, General Gage, he orders troops to Concord, Massachusetts. So what happened was that um, they wanted two things when they went to Lexington. First of all, they wanted to um, arrest some of the big leaders of the Sons of Liberty. That included John Hancock, Sam Adams, and Paul Revere. The other thing, the second thing that they wanted to do was to pick up weapons. They had an armory that was located in Concord, and they had to go to Lexington, Massachusetts to get there. And they wanted to pick up these weapons because they didn't want, they, they could see the tensions increasingly rising. They didn't want the colonists to have that. By the way, this is where we get the Second Amendment from, okay, arguably, um, because they literally took their weapons away from them. So the colonial reaction to this, this is, of course, where Paul Revere makes his famous ride that everybody knows Paul Revere from, but there's so much more to Paul Revere than just that ride. Um, you know, uh, and by the way, he didn't say the British are coming. He said the regulars are coming. He would not have said that because still at this point, all of the people in the colonies considered themselves British. So they wouldn't have said the British are coming because they saw themselves as British. But anyway, this is where the first shots are fired. Um, there's still debate, historians debate on who made the first shot, you know, the, the colonists or the, um, the, the British soldiers, the Redcoats. Either way, this is going to be the first time where they draw a battle, okay? Um, and so they were, they successfully were able to push them out. So here they are coming into Boston Harbor, and Paul Revere is making his famous ride. They go here, and they fight here in Lexington. This is where they stop them and push the British out. So they see this as kind of like a win, a call to arm, the very first time Minutemen were to work soldiers that had to be ready in a minute that's literally what they were okay so you can see this is you know an image of paul revere's ride where he's captured um and they bring it back all the way here they're, they're able to push the british completely out okay so anyway um one thing to note too that at the same time that all of these events are happening the enlightenment is also happening in europe and remember like I stated before, the British saw themselves as Europeans. I'm sorry, the British colonists saw themselves as Europeans. They saw themselves as British. So all of these Enlightenment ideas are bleeding themselves into the colonies. Okay, they start to um, ask for natural rights from like John Locke and these ideas of science and, um, you know, that they needed to, they should be taxed without representation. You know, the English Civil War had happened. The English Bill of Rights had been had been added, and so the colonists see themselves as they should be added to all of these things. So in order to really fully understand all of these events that happened, you need to understand that idea. And lastly, and, and you know, these important people, John Locke, um, where they come up with these natural rights, Rousseau, that believed in like the idea of social contract, that people should be able, to, willing to give up some rights to protect the whole group. And Montesquieu, he came up with the idea of three branches of government. When we start talking about the early republic and the development of how we formed our government, um, in particular, Montesquieu is going to be an important person to talk about. Okay, so... At this point, they still hadn't declared independence, okay? They still saw this as a dispute between the colonies and the British, okay? But by 1776, our very first American philosopher, a man named Thomas Paine, wrote Common Sense, and he wrote this to the common people, and anybody could read it, it, you know, basically saying, at this point, it should be obvious to everybody that we need to separate. And, you know, this has been credited with a final tipping stone, what caused people to say, hey, we need to declare independence. And in July of 1776, they draft the Declaration of Independence, and it begins. Okay? So, for those of you that are disappointed that I didn't go over the battles, um, I'm not actually a military historian. I'm, I'm a social historian. And so, um, there's actually a clip that I'm going to embed here called... Um, it's from Battlefield Trust, and they do a fantastic job in visual of the battles of the revolution. So those of you that want to learn about the battles of the revolution through that, I'm going to put the clip in there. That is fantastic. 
For our purposes of our history class, I'm much more focused on the actual social and political ramifications of it. My next clip is going to be Minority Voices of the Revolution, and so that will be an important key part for you to watch. So watch my next clip and my next video lecture on that. Thank you.